Always good to be here. A um, lot of history in this room. A uh, lot of great people here, and thank you for being here and staying for the last uh, seminar. It's 105 outside, in case you were wondering. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. We've sort of been blessed with a very interesting uh, pursuit of, of sort of wine growing. I uh, got this wild idea to go to Italy about, oh, I don't want to say how long ago it was now, but uh, in that I realized that uh, after four years there, I realized that uh, you are your property, and that is what the old world is all about. It's You don't buy grapes, you don't go anywhere else, it's what you are. And I came back to California, and there was this beautiful property uh, called the Nibam Coppola. It was really sort of um, pretty, just sort of a very odd situation. The release cycle was seven years. Um, I started in 1991. Uh, we were currently releasing, I think it was the 85 Rubicon at the time. And, but it was still pure. What the beauty of it was, it was, it was, they didn't purchase grapes. It was still the essence of what there was. And because there was never any money, and we had uh, Rafael Rodriguez, who'd been in since 1952, we had this wonderful old world perspective. And in doing so, we realized that we had all these old clones that were still pure. And uh, we went about searching uh, and rescuing one of the Cabernet clones. I uh, worked very hard to rescue what I believe to be two of the historic clones of Rutherford Zinfandel. And uh, it goes without saying that the Merlot industry of California was based off of cuttings taken from Inglenook in the, in the 50s. So when you rescue an old clone, it's really important to realize that, number one, how do you know that what you have is truly any different than anything else that might be commercially available? Why is it important? What are the benefits and risks? What are the costs? What does it cost to do this? These things are cheap. You know it's going to take some time. Where do I find more information? And of course, what's more important than anything is, does the new vine make better wine than the old vine? And that's something that you can constantly see. And a lot of technology has improved, but reality is, has wine improved? So do you know if you have something new? Is it truly something that we're saving? Well, the reality is that you don't know because the technology does not allow us to see the differences genetically between a clone, clone seven versus clone eight, even though the difference is simpler genetic material, different heat treatment. So, but you have to believe that history uh, is very important. In other words, if, if there's history that it made very good wine at one time, there's a very good history that it should make good wine in the future. Or that the people that selected it, and this to me is really the key, is that the people that selected it originally Take the greats like Nibam or Louis Martini. I mean, these guys knew what they were doing. And they probably selected something for a reason, which was probably sensory attributes, color, all the things that we currently look at. Those things were important then, they're important now. So um, this is also important. You know, you might have something that people might not care about. If anybody saw the 60 Minutes piece about, I think it was three weekends ago, they had something about rescuing all these old seeds of apple trees and roses and all these things that, you know, commercial available, commercially available varieties of all sorts of things have disappeared. And we're getting into smaller and smaller amounts of original material. And so this one gentleman actually took it upon himself to actually go out and save all of these old clones and selections, all these different varieties of fruit trees and or ornamentals just to save them. So I think he had a place up in Norway or somewhere up in the Arctic ice cap. And he just built this bunker to store all these old, old uh, selections. So, um, you know, certainly as a means of having an old clone, be able to say this is the clone that my grandfather planted, this is part, this is something that was part of us, part of our relationship with this property, always very important. It's important of difference, certainly, when you're selling grapes. You all know when clone 337 arrived, you couldn't find it. You know, everybody's, that was a point of differentiation. You had Cabernet, great, but it's the 337, yes, it was worth a premium. Uh, and technology will eventually catch up. There's no question that we will be able to see clones. The risk, of course, and this is whatever you see when you drive by a new vineyard that's September and it's bright red, uh, you just don't go out and cut wood. This is, this is a, you just avoid it. It's too expensive to do, there's too much risk with it, and you can reduce your yields and quality by doing so. So the way to do it is, uh, there's a couple of methods. Um, fast track is the way that I call it. It's basically by using wood selected and then using either the ELISA or the PCR analysis. It's about $2,000 of material costs in terms of sampling in about four years. Now, again, you're not going to end up with 10,000 buds. You're going to end up with only about three to four vines that you'll be able to use in further replicated trial. Uh, but the FPMS has also, they'll do this for you. So you can actually order, someone will come to you just like the rug doctor and uh, go through your vineyard and find out the vines, select them for you, pre-select them for you, run the analysis for you, just like agri-analysis could, with a much higher degree of, uh, of, of uh, knowledge going into the initial process. 
And lastly, and the most expensive way is the micro shoot tip propagation, which is certainly the most uh, reliable way of finding clean material. Basically what you're doing is we're talking about viruses. Viruses must replicate their, their proteins after all, so they need a host. So in a rapidly growing shoot tip, the expansion there that the replication is behind the actual growth of the plant, so you can actually outgrow the virus. Basically the whole principle is that you can outgrow the virus. And in the process of doing so, you can actually take a vine that's 100 years old and be able to take it and actually end up with several hundred thousand buds from the vine that was originally planted in the 1880s. Next thing you know, you have a clone. More information, agri-analysis, they have the website, and of course, FPMS, part of the UC Davis. So, this is what everybody cares about, right? Does the new vine make wine as good as the old vine? And I think it depends. I mean, I say, what are you looking at? Probably the old vines, certainly where we are, we had vines going back to the 1930s. Well, they were probably harvested between 23 and 24 bricks. They probably dehydrated to 26 or so. Significant variation in the vineyard blocks, definitely. There a lot of red leaf roll, all sorts of things there. You had different variations in colors. Some years were super, other years were not as good. Wanted to know why. You ended up selecting probably one out of every 10 vines to make your top wine. And then you would take multiple passes with the vineyard, multiple passes per vine in order to have enough fruit to collect together to create a fermenter. So what are you looking for? There's no question, if you clean up something, you're gonna increase your uniformity. Uniformity, as we know, what we saw with Phil's talk, uniformity in cane length, uniformity in cluster weight, uniformity in fruit per vine, all adds uniformity, which makes what? It makes up more of a precise collection of flavors and colors and hopefully tannin. So would I do it again? Absolutely, it was a lot of fun. So this is what we did. We went out to what we believe was to rescue one of the oldest clones of Cabernet in America, Nibom clone. In the process, we have to look at the geographical significance of the Rutherford area, historical providence, and what the actual references, the rescue efforts were, and the timing. So this is what we know, and I think Charles talked about this. We know that um, Zimbadel was planted in, uh, on the estate, which is another reason I wanted to save Zimbadel, by Watson, who was the founder of Inglenook, named the property Inglenook. Uh, he had Black Malvasia and Zinfandel. He sold to the Finnish ship captain, Gustav Niebaum, in 1879, closed in 1880. Nebaum was the one that was really quite spectacular in terms of his research. Of course, he had been around the world eight times, and most people went in one direction. And uh, he brought with him multiple varietals, Cabernet Sauvignon, Carignan, Malbec, Merlot, Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is credited with the first Pinot Noir planting in Carneros, was, of course, the Martinis. Talk to the Martinis, where'd you get it? I got it at Inglenook. And the Merlot, of course, Merlot number no. one was the first certified clone of Merlot in America. He treated a clone number no. three, which was the foundation of the industry. So we know there's provenance there. There's a lot of great varieties came through. A lot of research was done there. And, and uh, Nibon was really a spectacular uh, visionary. So Nibon did all his research in France. He was extremely well collected, connected. He was the type of person that would travel with dignitaries. Um, put it this way, when uh, Seward's Folly, the sale of Alaska from Russia to America, there were two cannons. Uh, commemorating the event, Nibam was given one of the cannons. Uh, there are four first growths. I'm sure he went to every one of them. Uh, most of the cuttings for the nurseries were down in the south of France, where obviously it was warmer. So that's the Inglenook estate. Uh, that's to the due north. I'm not sure if I can blind somebody here. But of course, this is the famous property of SBV number one, the Depans family, followed by the, by the tours who would go on to find. Cabernet and Rutherford, they were, of course, preceded by Gustav Niebaum, who created Inglenook, uh, Niebaum's original mansion. And the original plantings that we took were from an old property back here, which was planted in 1938. 38 planting came over to the 1960s. Eight planting, 68 plantings where we took most of our work. Deborah's work that she did started out from the 1938 planting. So basically, most important thing when you look at uh, any vine, everybody will tell you, don't, if you're gonna cut budwood, do not cut budwood that was in color. <laughs> so basically, clean vines go from green to yellow in the fall, they don't go from green to red in the summer. So uh, the PCR analysis, you wanna sample obviously individual vines, the vines have to be marked, it's very, very important to mark your vines and keep very accurate records. Uh, you're gonna select your cleanest vines, hopefully what you can do is from a single vine, you can bud 10 donor vines. Um, wait and watch, you've got a three year sampling period of time. Um, this is very important. You know, a lot of this, a lot of the old materials are always planted on St. George. So believe in Rupestris, St. George 1103, I like 1103 a lot, it seems to have a higher set. Uh, one of the parents of course is St. George anyway, so I think it's sort of in the family. And the increased block basically goes from one acre of clean vines. Alternative method, if you don't have as much, and we did not have as much, you're gonna to have to take a lot more vines, cuttings from a single vine and create a lot more vines. 
course, your factor of risk goes up exponentially. It's just a faction of uh, how many vines you select and how many of those are going to be, be virus. Uh, in year three or four, you can in increase block size. This is the way we rescued one of the old clones, uh, the Whirly clone and the Morzoli clone. The Morzoli clone, there's only one acre of which it was only about 15% Zimbadel. We only found three vines without virus. So we took a major, major risk with that one. So the visual is really important. The visuals, of course, you know, A, this is always interesting in the old vines, make sure it's Cabernet. <laughs> the Zimadel was interesting because we had Jean-Michel Borsico visit this old one acre block and he found 13 varieties in about 10 minutes. So if you cut blindly in the fall uh, or worse in the winter time, you can really have a problem. Somebody did that, I won't mention names, but I guess they like the wine, you know. So varietal crop apparent, don't take something that doesn't have a lot of crop. Probably not a good idea, but probably getting something that doesn't produce. You want a benefit to look at low shatter, good vigor, trunk diameter, critically important. A lot of vines, of course, get replanted to get hit by tractors, et cetera. You don't know if they're going to take the original <laughs> material. Always go for the trunk diameter, very, very important. And that was butter from the 38 planting. So what happens is you do all these cuttings, you take your samples into, in this case, agri-analysis, and uh, lo and behold, no leaf roll, no fan leaf, no yellow vein, a little bit of Pierce's disease. I got a lot of these really weakly positive Pierce's disease. Didn't make any sense. Corky bark at the time was not available for, for uh, ELISA screening. So that, that's a major negative. You got wood that's been continuously propagated for 100 years and you're getting a bunch of negatives. No, don't trust it. So it can't be, right? No leaf roll, no fan leaf. Come on, this is Rutherford. They did the original fan leaf studies in Rutherford. Uh, no corky bark, which wasn't available, just PD. Granted, it was near a house, but near gardens, but still didn't have the major symptoms of Pierce's disease, plus we still had crop. So threw this out, said so we're not going to use that information. We waited again, test again in the fall after the second visual inspection. So we did that again, ran into another, how many samples that was, 23 samples again uh, the following season. And now this looks more like what you'd expect, right? Now we're getting some leaf roll. Now we're getting some fan leaf. Now we're getting some corky bark. Okay, good. I feel better. I feel like the system's working. I'm capturing uh, possible problems. So what does that tell me? It tells me I'm going to invest the in owners a lot of money on a clone that possibly will turn into corky bark infected or repester stem pitting anything in three years once I put it onto something other than St. George or 1103 Balsam. So what I did was I went conservatively. I planted two acres with that clone. Risk management continued with only two acres on 1103 Paulson. So created a nursery block. So what I ended up having was about seven vines turned into two acres. That became my nursery block. Watched it, watched it, watched it. If it turns out to be clean over time, I'll use it in further study. But very luckily, what happened to us is that uh, Deborah Galeno, with the help of Phil Fries, thank you, Phil, very much, uh, came to do a research project on the historic clones of Cabernet and Napa Valley. Uh, fortunately, we were selected along with the C clone, which was the Disney, Silverado, Tokolon, Mondavi, and of course the uh, Ingolot clone from Yvonne Coppola. Individual sampling occurred in 1989, propagated in 1991 using the microshoot tip propagation. So that was the original planning. Uh, it's a beautiful photograph, and the reason the photograph was taken, which was probably what, May, something like that, similar timing as we were, probably taken in the 50s. The reason Raphael had this photograph taken was because of the snow. And that was all snow on the ridges. And he had a couple of growers that came in, major frost came through the valley that year, and uh, we took photographs of the snow. You can see the thunderheads, it was a horrible, horrible frost that came through, and, uh, and that's what they did. But once again, Inglenook was spared. That's the Cabernet over here. This is probably carrying on the forward, but that was it. That was an eight acre block plant in 1938. Then you wait seven years before Deborah came back. At this point, I was getting a little, you know, I had my other studies ongoing, so I was, I was already moving forward, but my results were coming back relatively negative. And it was finally when Deborah came back, she brought, uh, of all the stuff that she did, all the work that she did, she came back with three vines, three vines out of that 1938 planting that were clean, three. Now, when I say clean, they might have had virus, but through the Maristem propagation, she was able to clean them up. So I took those, turned them into each one row, and those row, I grew for five years. And then, wisely, I believe, we went through and sampled them again for a or PCR. And they came back beautifully, negative, negative, negative. Uh, since that time, uh, they have been taken by other wineries, who I always insist that if they're going to take the wood, they have to have it tested. Don't forget, you're putting us immediately back on a property that was been farmed since 1880, probably been in grapes since 19, 1872. Look, you've got nematodes, you've got Rutherford, you've got you know pieces of old roots that are still in the ground from the previous generations. So it doesn't take long for viruses to occur in new vineyards. And so they actually found virus in some of the new blocks. Just want to, you know, always vine by vine, 
do your homework. It's a cheap, cheap insurance. So now I'm very happy to say that it's been certified. It's clone 29. It's commercially available, as is the C clone, and as is the Tocolon clone. So it's fascinating. So it's the ability to go back in time, look at historically uh, varieties that made the same wines that were a lot of the wines that we talk about in terms of the old Inglenux and BVs at the time, and realize that that same material is now commercially available. I think it's a wonderful story, and thank you very much uh, both to uh, Phil for steering uh, Deborah our direction. But uh, it, was, it was a really worthwhile thing to do, and uh, it makes us very proud to have a clone named after the founder. Next thing I'm going to do is look at phenolics, because phenolics has been a major topic today. Phenolics both as grape as berry, both as well as wine. I'm a practical sort of, I consider myself a practical farmer, winemaker. I love informational, useful data. Um, I don't really delve too far into the, oh, into the individual berry work. I just, uh, I do love interns, but I, I don't have that many. <laughs> So I can't find enough of them to basically do that individual work. Thanks to uh, Enrique Herrero, who's our viticulturalist from Argentina, who's uh, done a wonderful job of sourcing a lot of the work for us in terms of doing our study. So basically, uh, the Harbison Adams assay was a major topic of rave of a year ago. And it's a, method, it's a wet chemistry method of analyzing tannins, large polymeric pigment, small polymeric pigment. Basically, it's all about dance partners. One tannin, one anthocyan forms stable color. The idea is that the more color that you have, the more tannin you can have. Obviously, wines with low color, high tannin are wines that we kind of say is quite obviously uh, tannic or perhaps uh, out of balance. So it's a wonderful study in terms of what balance is, and it changes every year, which is really what's so interesting. So basically, let's see if we can use that on these clones that we have and see if we come up with any information that would be at least useful to me uh, as the owner of the information, and then you can use it as you see fit. So basically, we're going to look at you know, basically what we talked about. Is it, can the original vines be measured to be certified or different from the original certification material. The parameters we're going to look at just for us will be total anthocyanins, phenols, polymeric pigment, small polymeric pigment, and tannin. For today, just for the ease of the presentation, I'm just going to do total anthocyanin of total phenols and uh, total tannin. The reason for that is that the sp small polymeric pigment and large polymeric pigment, you haven't seen a lot of that today, and it's not going to make a whole lot of sense. Basic does I think that if you have enough of the total phenols in solution, total enough tan, enough color, you've got a lot of large polymeric pigment. You have a lot of binding. And the question would be, is there, is there a difference every year or is it random? Season versus vine age, dry land farming versus irrigated, you know, it goes on and on and on. So I'm going to show you this. Clone 29, three generations, right? So I've got the 68 planting, which is called the garden. I've got planting that I did uh, starting back in with the original work that I had done, rescue effort. And then we have what uh, Deborah FPMS returned to us that I then put back into the field. Then we're going to look at this, this, the old workhorse, Clone 7, the old original Concanon clone. And we're going to look at what does cold soak do? This is a practical winery, practical winemaker sort of taking a look at it and sort of saying, what is it all about? Then lastly, we're going to look at the side-by-side -side comparison, Clone 4 versus 337. We have one piece of land that we purchased that had both these clones on it. And we'll be able to look at a uh, phenolic profile of two wines grown separately. Uh, fermented individually, but grown side by side. And then you have the 2005 Rubicon in front of you. So this is fascinating. So that's what it looks like. You have the original 68 planting, which we took from the 38. Deborah brought the vines back, we created the 96. And then after five years, that was taken, run through analysis again, and creating the 2001 planting. Uh, to put it in perspective, Highway 29 is there. We're looking due east at that point. Uh, the Inglenook Chateau is behind the knoll. Phenolics, okay, stay awake for just a little longer. <laughs> so basically, if you look at the yellow, let's start with the left to the right. Yellow is the 2000 planning from FPMS, 2001, sorry, which was the uh, most recent upstart block that we had. The Eliza work is what I had done, which is in the, the pink, and then the blue is the 68 original garden. And depending on the length of cold soak, you can see sort of the, the sort of, this is anthocyanin, there's, an, there's a pretty quick jump, as we see with a lot of Cabernet that's really ripe. We see a tremendous, uh, uh, extraction of color immediately within two or three days. We always like to look at this. This is always interesting. By the end of day three, generally speaking, you can be upwards of day three, certainly day four, you could be upwards of 50% of your total anthocyanin. So I look at these two, I say, okay, that's pretty interesting. The actually 05, you know, the 1994 versus the 68, those are really pretty similar. And considering the fact that they're fermented in different things, I'm not fermenting based on numbers. This, this is looking back at the data after the fact, and this is just how they turned out. If I look at tannins, uh, we know that uh, this one particular lot by sensory, this particular lot always seems, it tastes more tannic. For that reason, it was pressed early, pressed on day six. 
Uh, everything else, we always go to day nine, upwards of day 21. But what we saw is that the 1994 actually had higher tenants than the original 68 garden planning. If we take the total phenols, which to me is sort of a real great barometer of, of macerations, it's amazing really how similar these are coming up between vineyards planted basically over 20, 30 years apart. Uh, then garden, or the uh, 2000, again, more phenolic, more tannic, originally had to come off the skins earlier. So the conclusions, even though the vine ages might have varied 37 years to five years, uh, there was not nearly as much difference as you'd expect in a true fermentation. Um, similar ne levels of anthocyanin and total phenols, but some, some difference in tannin, which I think is more, that could be solubility or extractability. Uh, Non-replicated, one vintage of samples, but we do these every year for fun, and uh, we see very similar results. Next, we'll look at clone seven. So clone seven is interesting. Uh, Enrique took these photographs, and now I know why he did this. Obviously, clone seven, you know, the market clone, clone three, three, seven, as most people now know, is by, produces more fruit per acre, and it's by cluster. Uh, clone four from Mendoza, uh, clone 29. Enrique sampled these, and I now know why he was trying to say that the clone 29 is more like clone four, so clone 29 probably came from Mendoza. <laughs> and now where's his royalty check? Um, again, one cluster taken by a very biased individual. <clears throat> so, cold soak. Everybody talks about cold soak. How many people actually do cold soak? Michelle Roland, for example, five days, 50 degrees, period. Okay. So, so I'm just talking for nonsense. I'm not talking about sensory attributes or anything. But let's just look at really what, what, what happens. Two-day cold soak is in blue. Four and a half, five-day cold soak is in hot paint. Um, so basically, we're starting pretty similarly, uh, day one. Obviously, the second day, you can see there's a 50% increase, in, almost 100% increase in, tan, in color. And then fermentation temperatures are, are rise, must go from 50 degrees up to uh, 85 degrees. And you can see this pretty uniform level of extraction. What's interesting is that the slope of these curves generally points to the higher concentrations. In other words, the higher the slope, generally the higher you're going to have as total. Now, the same lot put it at 50 degrees and held for four and a half days before warming to 82 degrees and starting the fermentation. Basically, all right, slopes are the same, and basically the peaks are the same. In other words, the cold, in my opinion, the cold soak did not increase the real number, which is your total anthocyanin at the end of time. Take a look at tannins, it's almost identical. Tannins came up, slopes are very similar in our total at the end of nine days of fermentation, where, we, where this information ends, relatively similar. In other words, the cold soak did not affect either the color or the total tannin at the end of nine days. Total phenols, just as you'd expect, the tannins are the same, ten, total phenols tend to follow. And it's almost identical. They started earlier, but the slopes are almost the same, and the final endpoint is almost the same. So it leads to really, really, so it leads to really, really big question. Um, What's the cold soak two versus five? Well, the cold soak is very effective. I mean, it's pretty amazing to think that in Cabernet, without really doing anything, you get 50% of your total color after two days without doing anything, or 60% if you wait for five days. So in other words, an extra three days, you only gave you another 10% of free available anthocyanin. But this is what's critical, is that in the same time frame, only 15% of the total tannin was basically uh, extracted. So what's the takeaway there? Tannins do not really come quickly out of a water-soluble solution. They really need the alcohol and the temperature. Anthocyanin on the other side, hey, will come out in water at 50 degrees. So anthocyanin and tannin total phenols and finished wine were very similar after nine days of both replicated. So the second conclusion is what's more important? Is it cold soak or total contact time? In other words, if you waited to 12 days, whether I soaked for three days or seven days, I'll guarantee you I'll probably be within a 50 to 100 parts of total anthocyanin, uh, total phenols, and tannin. So personal opinion is cold soak is very effective with tannic fruit as it allows winemakers to sort of front load the macerations with color, allowing for draining early in the case of you have very, like that one lot we looked at that I had, that is very, very tannic. So if I can get some all my color out, I know I extracted all my color, now my tan is going to be a desired level based on style. What about buds? This is something that I think people always come back to after they end up cold soaking. Well, five days is good. How about seven? Let's see, pediococcus will love you, you know? And so cold soak is obviously at risk if you have damaged fruit, stuck fermentations in the cellar. More time with that alcohol or healthy yeast population. Cold means cold, 48 to 50 degrees. Uh, that is the swimsuit model. Um, I run the NDVIs every month starting in June all the way through October. 
the reason for that is that I think that the, the canopy uh, quality uh, and the activity of your um, chlorophyll in your leaf canopy is extremely important. And I like this particular color. This color happens to relate to a certain amount of, of chlorophyll. But what I find is that there are certain flavors that come out of this. This is actually an eight foot row vertical. This is a 12 foot row planted, which is why you get a lot of reflectivity off the ground. So discount that. So basically you have two Cabernet clones, clone four, clone 337, planted side by side. What I like to do with this is that whenever I see an NDVI like this within days of harvest, it tells me so much information. I look at that and I say, everything in this band right here should be very, very similar. And what you like to see, even regardless of clone, that for example is probably a miss or a young vine. It's a vineyard that we purchased. So the fact that I'm seeing really healthy colors here, healthy colors here, even though the soil is relatively different, but all the irrigation management and all the irrigation valving and all the irrigation in terms of gallons per vine have all been changed based on the individual um, NDVIs. If you saw this NDVI from four years prior, it would have been dark green here, possibly purple here. You can see there's a little bit of inclination to grow larger. And the process of basically going through the NDVI work and, and turning your irrigation and, and using this tool for what it's really supposed to be, which is uniformity, um, why, uh, I just look at that and I say, why wouldn't these wines be similar? So let's take a look. That's pretty similar. So clone four, three, three, seven. I mean, this is, again, this is not information. I went back and looked at it for this talk, which I did two days ago. And uh, I was amazed at how similar these, these were, almost identical. And one thing when you're looking at color, one thing I look at in terms of a year, in terms of quality of a year, is always color. And the amount of lots that always, how many lots break 700, 800, up to 1,000? For Rubicon, like all the lots to break 1,000 ppm to color, I like it. Then I count how many days they stay at 1,000. One, two, three, four, five. You know, they start to crash. It's probably binding with tannin at that point. So that to me is a very, very useful uh, piece of information. I call it the theory of the tennis balls. You go into your garage, you find two tennis balls. Which one's, which one's the newer ball? You drop them from the same height, they bounce at the same time, and then slowly there's a difference between the height of the bounces. And the higher energy balls, what I call the higher energy fermentations, you have this great bounce every day, higher and higher quality, which I relate to energy. And that, to me, tells me a great lot. When I see a lot peak, start to fall, that's a lower quality lot. Immediately, I'm not going to spend a lot of money on new barrels for that lot. Instead, we're dedicated to a program useful for other, other uh, lower end wines. Now, tannins, that's unbelievable. Uh, obviously, you can see here that one probably had uh, a little higher extract by a three-day cold soak versus a two-day cold soak. But like we saw before, the cold soak doesn't really matter in terms of totals. And these actually came up to identical numbers when I ran the two. So nearly identical tannin quantities for both clones. Total phenols, like you'd expect, the tannins are the same. Total phenols should be the same. And this is amazing. It started one day later, but they actually overlapped on the total at day 10. So nearly identical, which to me is really quite phenomenal. So conclusion, clonal trials, very similar to lantho, phenols, and, and tannin. So similar that you have to wonder why. And uh, I'd say you have to believe it's the site and the consistent management. Um, I'm a really, really strong believer in uh, cordon pruning, um, single bud spurs, um, sort of what Phil had just discussed. But I don't necessarily like it on vertical. I prefer it on the V, just because I think Cabernet wants to sort of grow out in a V. And with single bud spurs, uh, with cordons, you have uniform shoot length. Um, it's so nice to see other person, someone else's data that sort of uh, corroborates that, that idea. But we just find that if you want uniformity, cordons is the only way to go. Without a lot of handwork, removing the weak shoots, et cetera, which can't be done. So then you need to compare sensory, which we're not going to go into today. That's your job, you know, because it's going to behave differently. We have different piercing levels, et cetera. That's what's going to happen. So a summary, not replicated, not treatment specific, but even though they're not treatment specific, then why are they so uniform? And all you can say is that there's a lot of it is property, and there's a reason that a lot of these clones, Tony Soder had a great quote. He said, I never met a Cabernet clone I didn't like, which was very different than Pinot Noir clones, or Chardonnay clones, or Sauvignon Blanc clones. And so the reality is the Cabernet clones available commercially are really pretty good. And a lot of great work was done to bring in the ones that were commercially viable in terms of yield, but also on a consumer level, produce the best color, best flavors, and best tannins. So much to learn, to-do list. This is really big for Zinfandel, wings and shoulders. Everybody cuts them off. We do too. Uh, deficit irrigation in phenolics, what does it do? You saw some interesting work um, on uh, heavier irrigations after 20 bricks. That's very fascinating work. We've seen the same thing with color. 
crop levels in phenolics, rootstocks in phenolics, grower block quality assessment tool, wouldn't that be great? Instead of having a grower, how did you make that wine? Say, well, this is how I made your wine, and by the way, you're 15% less colored than last year, but your neighbors are about 17% higher than last year. So great stuff all the way around. My thanks, that's the Eagle Look Estate. Uh, that's what Captain Nebaum bought, uh, built a cabin. His, he married uh, Martha, and he said he wanted to live in Sausalito on a boat. She said, no way in hell I'm gonna live on a boat. So he built the Nebaum mansion and got in the wine business. So that's great. That's the old Ziva that we rescued here. Um, all the old Cabernets up here, where we talked about it, over here on the other side of the house. Thanks, Tony Bulk and the original Blackberry. Deborah Good Galena, of course, from their team at FBMS. Thanks a million. Uh, the Harvest and Adams assay, bless the interns, common theme today. Uh, Rafael Rodriguez for his youth and vitality, and uh, Francis for uh, believing that newer isn't always better. Uh, and then Glenn Freibersauer, we lost him to cancer a couple years ago. And Glenn was such a great friend at Clone 29 and all the research work we were trying to do that couldn't have done it without him. And then the last thing I'm going to leave you with is the, uh, this is something that we all have to keep in mind. The, the Harbors and Adams assay, uh, what Doug Adams is trying to do this year, he did not receive funding to keep the work going, ongoing with his uh, assay. So this year, Doug can't continue with all the work we've already done. We're helping them out, we're trying to figure out, our goal is to come up with something that looks just like a pH meter. Drop it into your wine sample, it'll spit out your total phenols, anthocyanins, colors, large polymeric pigment, small polymeric pigment in about seven seconds. So all this chemistry stuff, it'll be like basically, you know, writing uh, the original DOS code back in computer science class. And that's pretty phenomenal, but we gotta get there. And uh, unfortunately the funding was pulled. So uh, this always, this shocks me, Roger told me that, that the department's the same size it was in 1970. We've got to do something about that. So if all we have to do is, you know, what they did with the Pierce's disease funding was amazing. You know, people can rally around a problem. People can rally around a pest, right? But, uh, you know, the PD monies that they did, does everybody, does everybody know this? They created a Cabernet and a Chardonnay vine that are 85% genetic, that are resistant to Pierce's disease. So you realize that the university, with the monies collected, the Pierce's disease, have now saved the industries of Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, wherever they're trying to grow Cabernet and Chardonnay. And it's amazing to think that, that all it took was just sort of a common goal. So we can do this. All we need to do, in my opinion, is just do a 0.5 grower assessment and 0.25 assessment on grades by grower. On $1,000 a ton, winery pays five bucks, growers pay 250. Believe it or not, that would have a guaranteed yearly money to stabilize the department and fund key research. Hard to imagine that you have some key researchers here who are not working on wine, they're working on food. And let's face it, we're gonna have all this stuff. We have global competition, thank God for the weak dollar right now, but it's gonna turn around. Global warming is gonna change a lot of things the way you do business. And there's new major pests every couple of years, and as organic certified grower in Rutherford, you know, in five years, basically going from glass living sharpshooter, vine mealy bug, to now the light brown apple moth, it's like, what's next? So spread the word, we gotta do this when it comes up, it's gonna come up, you just gotta be obstructive and be ready to say, it makes sense. If we did it for Pierce disease, we can do it for funding for the university. And research, remember, this is what always blows my mind, the RO machine, which has saved, think how much money we don't pay in taxes because all those wines bottle at 13.99. <laughs> um, you know, if they only had one penny for the gallon, you know, but they don't, of course, which is typical. But this is really what's critical, research does drive profits. And thank you for your time.